This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 142, recorded on July 15th, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast where we talk all about viruses. Joining me today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. Hello. Hello, Hello Alan, who hasn't been introduced yet. <laughs> <laughs> you're, the, you're the guy who says hi to everyone. Uh, yeah, well, you know. And that's I shouldn't have pulled you on first, right? It's, it's okay. I can deal with it. I thought you it's would okay. like it. You know, every now yeah, and then you like right. that. That's nice. Yeah, that's good. Okay, and then we'll bring in Alan from Western... Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here, and hello back to you, Rich. Hello. <laughs> hello back to you. Beautiful weather all around today, right? Well, ah. I got overcast, pending thunderstorms, 80 degrees. You know, it's not That's gorgeous great. here. Okay. It's gorgeous, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gorgeous here, too. It's cooled down Good. a bit. And I, und I understand in Minneapolis, which is where Rich and I are heading tomorrow, it's they're having a heat wave. Yeah, it looks hot there. Yeah, the whole middle section of the country is uh, supposedly scorching. But uh, Minnesota is closed, isn't it? I mean, you know, how oh, are we right. gonna, how are we going to do this? <laughs> Apparent apparently the meeting goes on, but the rest of the place is closed. Why is it closed? The government shut down. I see one of these things, you know. Okay. The one that is the kind of thing the federal government's thinking yeah. about doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. soon to be replicated thing. nationally. So Minnesota's right. testing it out, I think. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Well, what we're talking about is Rich and I are heading out to the American Society for Virology annual meeting where we're going to do a TWIV on Tuesday. So Good if fun. You're, if you're at the meeting, come by. Yeah. Because we'll, they're going to give us lunch and you'll get an hour and 15 minutes of TWIV. Our guests will be. Julie Overbaugh, and Stacy Schultz-Cherry. So that'll be good. Yep. However, today we have a TWIV, and we have two papers to talk about. The first, just published in Science, entitled Probing Individual Environmental Bacteria for Viruses by Using Microfluidic Digital PCR. Not just microfluidic, but digital Actually, I don't get the digital part. I think it's if, one color or the other. Okay. Yeah, because okay. I think I think that's it. It's a little bit of a stretch buzzword game, <laughs> but I, I think the idea is because they're probing for two different markers in each well and using different colors, they're calling that digital. Right. Okay, that just eluded me completely. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, this could have been a twim um, paper, but I thought. It would be cool to talk about it. Sure. So the whole premise here is that now we can sequence everything. And we can sequence the ocean and find that there are tons of viruses per milliliters, 10 to the 6th, for example. Per so the question is, what do they infect? What do they infect? You don't know where the hosts are. And there's really no way. I mean, the diversity is enormous. You can't just start going through. You don't know what the hosts are. Right, and 99% of microbes we can't culture. Right. Yeah, so this uh, paper describes a way to get around that. It's very clever. Um, digital, <laughs> well, the microfluidics is the, is the real part. Microfluidics here. is the amazing part. So microfluidics, I understand. My, ver my explanation is really tiny tubes and small amounts of fluid. <laughs> yeah, I, that works for me. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a technology I've been watching for for several years oh, yeah? and it's mm -hmm. uh, um it, it's big in the drug industry where mm -hmm. they're always trying to do things in small volumes because you know they want to screen a bazillion compounds and you don't want to have to have large quantities of them right um, and also things like diagnostic tests um but the the mm -hmm. basic idea is if you take a um a, a really narrow tube like a capillary tube that we would use in a lab you stick it in fluid and the fluid rises up the tube now, just shrink that tube down to a fraction of the, of the diameter of a human hair and put it on a chip, and you can use it to pipe fluid from one place to another. Mm -hmm. 
and then you need some sort of valve, and you can have these various uh, very clever electrically engineered valves, um, and then you can connect the device to uh, to a control system that turns the valves on and off and allows the fluids to flow, and you can move vanishingly tiny quantities of just picoliters of fluid through these channels and move them around and put them together, uh, which means that you could do all of the conventional molecular biology and microbiology chemical reactions in really, really, really tiny containers. Yeah, so this array that they're working with, uh, you know, I think of it as kind of like a multi-well dish, except, as you say, it's really small. It has 765 reaction chambers, mm -hmm. each um, 150 by 150 by 270 microns, each containing six nanoliters. That's really small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're doing PCR on this whole thing. So you use yep. the microfluidics to deliver all the PCR reagents to each well. Right. right. You have to deliver stuff, you have to wash it out, then give something else. So you have to do all these refreshments, and you do that with microfluidics, right? Right. Ama right. Amazing. Then you can, then yeah. you can thermally cycle. Right. Uh, there, there are different systems that will, in some cases, do thermal cycling on individual portions of a plate, or you can do the whole thing, depending on how the experiment is set up. Okay, so they use this 765 uh, well array, if you will. And in each well, they put a single bacterium. That's what's going to happen here. And right. then, on average. I think they just diluted it out. That's yeah, right. That's right. By so, a plus so, on distribution, exactly. you get about they're one. Star the, they're, starting with the, an, they're starting with the hind gut of a termite. Yeah, these right? guys are interested in termites and the bacteria that live in the hind gut, right? Yeah, and I think right. this was kind of a proof of concept, too. You could apply this to any type of sure. of system. You could take ocean water, you could take whatever, but the termite hind gut is, a, is something that's been studied a lot. It's very important ecologically and also economically. Um, Alan, and, what, is, what do the bacteria do in the termite hind they, gut? They digest the wood. Mm-hmm. Right, so, and that, I was wondering about this because they don't state this specifically, but uh, in terms of mm, alternate energy sources and that kind of stuff, things that can degrade cellulose are important. Have I got that right? Yes, and especially things that can degrade wood because it's not just cellulose, it's lignin, okay. um, which causes huge problems, I understand, in things like uh, like efforts to convert wood into ethanol. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which may not be the most efficient energy production system anyway, but uh, if you want to convert wood into some kind of other type of energy or fuel, the termite hindgut is a really good model. Okay, great. And also termites eat houses, so you know, even, even without the energy argument, there, there's a multi-billion dollar uh, industry at stake here. Hmm. Okay. So they say here they dilute the samples such that the majority of chambers get either one or no bacteria. Poisson distribution. Poisson, too. there you go. Yeah. Yep. So you put a, so you take these termites, you dissect their hind guts. They have bacteria there, and the goal is, what viruses are in each bacterium, right? Because right. the assumption is that you're going to look for viruses that are either attached to these cells or they have their genomes in them, in some way. And then, so a lot of these bacteria, you put single bacteria in each well. A lot of them won't have any viruses and. Some of them will have some, right? right. Single, right. so you dissect the the termite, you take out the bacteria, you put one zero or one cell per well of this seven hundred sixty five uh, array, and then you do PCR. And you the do primer PC selection is a problem. Yeah, what are you going to prime with, right? So bacteria is not that big a problem because you can look for ribosomal RNA, which is what they right. do, right? They use right. some small uh, ribosomal subunit. RNA, which is universal. It's going to pick up all bacteria, right? Right, right. So that's easy. But then you have to look for viruses. They spend a lot of time talking about how they decided on what viral genes to look at. And they, they did some feasibility studies with two genes, a terminase subunit 
and a portal protein. Now, I thought, Rich, you could tell us what a terminase is, right? So, uh, yeah, well, I, I could take a stab at it a couple of days ago, and I can take a better stab at it now that I've done some, <laughs> <laughs> done some cramming. Um, so the classic terminase is uh, uh, phage lambda. Uh, phage lambda DNA replicates, as do many bacteriophage and other viral DNAs, uh, as concatamers, so genome length molecules hooked to each other end to end. Uh, and then uh, individual molecules are stuffed into particles from this concatamer, and somehow they have to be cleaved into genome length particle, uh, genome length uh, DNAs, and uh, the end has to be uh, threaded into the capsid somehow. Uh, the lambda terminase actually cleaves the DNA, and I think also plays a role in delivering the DNA to the capsids. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing they look at is um, what was it? A portal uh, protein. A portal protein. So the portal is uh, basically the uh, pore on the capsid through which the DNA threads uh, to get into the capsid. And this is a fascinating structure. It's a it's a pump. Uh, it's ATP-driven pump that's very complex and has a, a very interesting structure. The structure is, by and large, worked out on a bunch of different things that pumps the DNA uh, into these heads, uh, uh, ultimately to uh, incredibly high pressures. So basically, uh, they were looking for primers for proteins that they could be confident really represented phage proteins and not bacterial proteins, mm -hmm. and those sorts of functions things that are designed to package DNA molecules uh, into a phage particle are likely, and they have arguments to support this, are likely to be phage-specific. And so that's why they chose these things. Right. All right. So now you can take our, our ribosomal primers and our primers. I think they ended up using um, the uh, terminase to do yes. the actual experiments. Yes. And you can... You can do PCR on all the single cells in this array. And then some of them will light up with the bacterial primer. So you use fluorescent uh, nucleotides so that you can see when you get a product by a color, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And some of the wells have nothing. Some have just bacteria. And then some have bacteria in phage. And some different. have just phage. Do so some have phage? Let's see. The bacteria I think, I think are, so. Yeah, they do. So the, the phage is red. And the bacteria is uh, green. And some have red, some have green, and some have both. And so they have right. one photo here where you can see all 765 wells. And there's one well that has a phage and a bacterium in it. So I guess you have to do a lot of these arrays right. to get some good numbers. So then you can assume that that virus is associated very intimately with that particular bacterium. Right. right, because the dilution and the Poisson distribution would argue that it is highly unlikely that they would coincidentally have ended up in the same well. Right. In fact, if you look at this, look at this image, they've diluted it out to the point where I think only about 10% of the wells have anything in them. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So you've got to use a lot of these. And they process the image in a really dramatic fashion where they mask the well on one side uh, on one side or the other so that in the resulting image it looks like, it almost looks like the wells are split in two. This baffled me for a minute until I realized it was a a, a, a way of actually processing the image. It looks as if the mm -hmm. wells split in two with the red on the left and the green on the right or both occupied, but yeah. that's just a, a, a signal processing um, right. trick. Yes, so the, you take a, a red, which would be the whole well, and a green and then you just cut them in half and superimpose them right basically and there's a lot of math associated with this a lot of math where they have supplementary yeah. data which goes on and on and, and on, on and on a lot of statistics and so forth right it's really a lot of work here and right it's compressed i mean in typical science magazine fashion it is ultra compressed yes uh, uh, also i want to make one one more comment about the uh, terminase they they recognize that uh, even uh, having chosen this, that it's not going to pick up all viruses around. It's a limited subset of phage that could be there. Yes. Okay? yes uh, right. But at least of the things that they could identify that might 
that might be very specifically virus proteins, it was uh, as ubiquitous as they could uh, come up with. Yeah. Okay. So, but it, right. at least you know the virus goes with the host. Besides, this right? is kind of proof of concept it anyway. Is. So yeah. they looked at 3,000 individual cells, and they found 41 co-localizations, in other words, a, a cell and a virus. And these, So then you can take the nucleic acid and say, what bacterium is it? Right? So this blows my mind, okay, because now they didn't really say how they did this, but the microfluidics is such that you can actually retrieve in a pure form from one of these six nanoliter wells mm -hmm. the PCR product to go ahead and sequence, right? right. Yep. Yeah. My God, that's incredible. <laughs> And uh, they didn't. It, it's not in this paper, but if you if you project a few years into the future, you can easily imagine a system that would automatically micro, um, you know, nanopipette those samples into a sequencing microfluidic system. Right. Take care of the whole thing. Yeah. That's you can just amazing. go home and watch Star Trek. That's right. Yeah, well, I, I read this, and I said, that's it. I've reached my limit. <laughs> oh, I had exactly the same reaction. I my brain is full. Yes. I said, it's time for me to get out of the way. Yeah, okay? I, that's what, Rich, I thought the same thing, because here we, I'm an old guy doing plaque assays, and this is just great stuff. I can't do this. Right. Leave it for the young people. Absolutely. The best thing that we can do is to try and turn the young people on by telling them about yeah, it. Yeah, we could talk about it, right? Which Absolutely. is what we do. All right, so they got 41 co-localizations, and 28 of them were involved four what we call phylotypes of bacteria, one, two, three, and four, and they had associated phages. The bacteria were all treponema, the genus treponema, which, of course, are spirochetes mm -hmm. and the famous treponema pallidum, the causative agent of... Syphilis. There you go. Large pox. The great pox. Yes. The great pox. Yes, treponema and their associated phages. So there you go. You've got phages that presumably infect treponema. Um, I wonder if you could somehow prove this in, in an old guy experiment or an, <laughs> an old scientist type experiment <laughs> where you grow up the bacterium and then infect it with the phage because it's all gone after right. all this processing. So I don't know how you get back to that, right? Well, if you you'd have to be able to culture these uh, spirochetes, and I think a lot of them you can't. Can't, yeah. Yeah, but uh, to start with, I'll bet you these. Uh, here's a challenge for these microfluidics guys. It's probably not a challenge. Well, they only got one cell. Well, okay. So they have to basically make a replica plate. Yeah. All right. You got to mm -hmm. start off and do the distribution, and then you have to. Well, you can't culture them. If you've only got a single bacterium, they at least have to divide once in order to make an effective replica plate. Okay, so also, that's be a problem. also, after you yeah. PCR'd it, that bacterium is quite dead. Uh, yes, quite dead. That, yeah. Well, that's why I was saying you'd basically have to. Uh, um, uh, you'd have to replicate, right? You'd have to. You'd have to somehow let it reproduce before right. you do the PCR. You seed the plate. You let it grow a couple of cycles. You do the replica. Okay, you keep the one replica alive, and you do the PCR on the other. Okay. On the but other course, hand, if we knew the conditions under which you could actually get these things to grow, then you wouldn't have to do this experiment with microfluidics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but it wouldn't be nearly as much fun. True. So a couple of interesting tidbits of information that I thought are worth relaying. First, they, they say half, excuse me, half of the free-swimming cells in the gut are not infected with anything that they looked for using their probe. 12% were infected. So I don't know what it really should be in the gut. We don't really know, and whether they're missing a lot or what. Well, that's where this idea that the terminase doesn't really capture everything comes yeah. in, okay? Because right. they may only be looking at a, a fairly small subset of all the phage that could be there. I guess you should redo this with some other probes, basically. Yeah, guys, right? get it together, okay? And now spirochetes are not the <laughs> spirochetes are not the only bacteria in there, of course. Yes. So um, those are the ones they picked up in this dual screen. But if, presumably, if you look for a different gene, maybe you pick up different phages. So that's interesting. I also they also made some uh, trees showing the association of bacteria with these specific phages. 
And what they say is that there is a non-random distribution of host-associated terminase alleles, Mm -hmm. which they say means there's not a lot of lateral gene transfer. So there's not a lot of mixing of genes among phages. Right. You got... You can sort the, just by phylogenetic analysis, you can sort the phage out into different groups or clades. And uh, you can do the same with the uh, bacteria. And the clades of phage seem to cluster with hosts, uh, uh, hosts yeah. okay, as if they're kind of stuck with each other most of the time, except for this one orange group here. Phage host three, okay? yeah. That uh, mm-hmm. kind of scattered all over the place, but uh, so that's their that's what they base their argument about limited lateral transfer on. Right. Makes sense to me. Yeah, that's very in- so. Yeah. yeah. What else is interesting? Probability of cross species transmission or lateral gene transfer decreases with the phylogenetic dif- distance of the hosts. So again, on that phylogenetic arrangement, the more distant the host, the bacterial host is, the less. A horizontal transfer. I think that those were the main points I wanted. Right. Anything else we're missing here? No, I don't think so. It's just the technology is just mind-boggling. It's very cool stuff. So they say here, in a marked departure from classical phage enrichment techniques, and you read between the lines the experiments that the old guys do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Specific viral host relations can be revealed in uncultivated cells harvested straight from the environment. So you could do this with ocean water. You could do it with dirt, your gut, your your belly button. Yep. Now and this is a good example of a something that the politicians would probably have fun with and ridicule. You know, looking at bacteria from termite guts. You know, what are yep. these guys doing at Caltech? Um, but you know, it has profound implications. Well, yeah, as we've yeah, discussed. Sure. I mean, this could be used for many in many ways and get incredibly interesting stuff. For guys who study termites, this is very interesting, right? Actually, who funded this? Uh, okay, NIH. The NIH Director's Pioneer Award. Oh, what that's is that? cool. What is that? Uh, I'm. Uh, I think I've heard of this. It's a kind of a. It's a kind of a. You know, oh, that sounds really interesting award for people with a track record, you know. Let's throw some money at these guys and see what they mm. can do with it. It's a good, good thing. And then they got yeah. an, an American exactly. Recovery and Reinvestment Act grant. Great. And they got also an R01. So it's NIH stuff, Department of well, Energy, NSF. They have a lot of different okay. sources here. Well, that's really good. Yeah, okay. it's great. Because this is this is something where, you know, the grant for this is not going to start off with, I'm going to cure this human disease, right? Right. Yeah, right. Uh, and yet NIH still is sufficiently enlightened That's to uh, put some money in there. There are only four authors, Arbel Tadmore, Elizabeth Otison, Jared Ledbetter, and Rob Phillips. It's actually impressive yep. because you often see many, many authors on these big papers. Very Great cool stuff. stuff. Great well, stuff. they didn't they didn't credit all the uh, microcapillary tubes. <laughs> <laughs> so these microfluidics are made by a company named Fluidigium. I don't know if that's how you say it. I think it's Fluidime. Fluidime. Uh, I Fluidime passed uh, something like that. Yeah, right? so no. <clears throat> Fluidime. Good. Try, nice Flu- try. Fluidime. A- a- Alan would have gotten it. But yeah, there there are actually a whole bunch of companies working on. Um, Microfluidics of various sorts, but I, I guess this one was fluidime. Particularly, fluidime. Yeah, they mentioned this one in their in their methods. That's why I, I took a look uh, at it's, it. You know, we were talking about paradigm shifts <laughs> last week. Uh, I, I just, it's hard to imagine where this is going. Paradigms from fluidime. Yeah, there you go. That's uh, the microfluidics and all of this sort of nanotechnology is going to is opening up yeah. uh, huge possibilities. Yeah, very cool stuff. stuff. Okay. The second paper is, well, was published in Clinical Cancer Research. It's called Phase 1 Clinical Study of Seneca Valley Virus, a Replication-Competent Picornavirus in Advanced Solid Tumors with Neuroendocrine Features. And this is a paper on viral oncotherapy. Uh, which we have talked about a few times here on TWIV with Grant McFadden and also with, what was the company, Oncolytics? Yes. Yes. There you go. 
And this is using a picornavirus. I thought this was a bit interesting to have, a, well, very interesting, actually. So let's talk a little bit about this virus. Picornaviruses, of course, are well known to me since we work on them. And Seneca Valley virus was actually discovered in 2002 at a company called Generic Th Genetic Therapy. They were growing adenoviruses for vector use, and they found this virus as a contaminant. And you'll like this, Rich. They were doing cesium chloride purification of the adenovirus, and they saw a an extra band. Good for them. Go after that band. They pulled what it is out. That? They pulled it out. They ran it on a gel. They ended up looking at it in the EM. They sequenced it. It turned out to be a picornavirus, and they uh, named it Seneca Valley virus. I don't know why it got that name. I couldn't find it. And Seneca Valley is. Well, there are Seneca Valleys all over the place, so I don't know where it came from. But that's it, Seneca Valley Virus 1. I wonder how they felt about that. You know, on the one hand, they got a contaminant. On the other hand, they got a new virus. I think it's cool to get a good virus, yeah. to get a new virus. Yeah. Well, and if it turns out to be as useful as uh, these folks hope, it could be, you know, kind of a Fleming moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. right. So then in the subsequent years, 12 other virus isolates... Serologically very similar to this Seneca Valley virus number one, were isolated at the National Veterinary Services Lab, which is in Ames, Iowa. They were isolated from pig specimens submitted from several different states, suggesting that this infects pigs uh, all around the U.S. I also found a poster online, uh, which was presented at a meeting. Uh, we've got so many windows open here. There you go. Epidemiology of Seneca Valley virus identification and characterization of isolates from pigs in the United States. And they, uh, they isolate the virus from pigs. They show that the pigs uh, have antibodies. And so this appears to infect pigs. So where did it come from in the original contamination? Now, I gather it doesn't really hurt the pigs especially, right? Apparently not. No, they shot up the pigs in this poster, right? And the and it, and it didn't do them any harm. Yeah, it doesn't hurt them. Yeah, and probably we would have heard about this virus earlier if it did hurt them. Yeah. So where did it and, come from? Where did the contamination come from, guys? Uh, porcine trypsin. How about yeah. that? Somebody's ham sandwich. <laughs> yeah, I think. No, it's probably <laughs> probably a pig product that was being used in the lab. Yeah, trypsin or something like that. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, the circovirus contamination of uh, the rotavirus vaccine. Yeah, uh, same idea, was, right? Same idea is it's uh, contamination of cell cultures with uh, uh, biologicals that are re reagents that are uh, derived from uh, pigs, and notably, people trypsinize cells from their culture dishes. They use the mm -hmm. proteases to get the cells off the dishes, and uh, trypsin is one source of that is pigs. Right, and it's worth noting that um, in a lab you use a lot of animal products and mm -hmm. and yeah they're purified to varying degrees but you you mix up a, what's called a defined culture medium and it has bovine serum albumin in it and it's well yeah it's defined but what did the cow have right because um, that came from somewhere and, and of course you use all these mouse reagents and and pig uh, pig trips and and um so these things can uh, can get in now what happens next it's not clear. Someone decided to infect a variety of human cancer cell lines with this virus. I don't know why they would do that. I mean, if you're interested in oncotherapy, I guess you try every virus that you can get your hands on. But someone did, and they found that this virus likes to infect uh, tumor cell lines that have neuroendocrine features. And that means that the tumor ha is derived from either nervous tissue or endocrine cells. And right. one of the kinds of tumors that falls in that category are small cell lung carcinomas or small cell lung cancers, SL, SCLC. So they tested a bunch of lines, and 13 of 23 of these small cell lung cancer lines were susceptible to this virus. And then they, they engrafted mice with these small cell lung tumors, and then infect them with the virus. And they found that they got complete and durable eradication of tumors in 60 out of 60 mice. 
So first you look in cells. It kills tumor cells. Then you make an animal model. It does pretty well. So the next thing is this phase one clinical trial to see right, if see it if helps people. See if it's safe in people. So why would this be good? It's a lytic virus. It's an animal virus. So it doesn't infect people. So it probably won't cause disease, although that's what you want to find out in the phase one trial. There's no pre-existing immunity. Right. Doesn't integrate into the chromosomal DNA, which is a problem with the retrovirus therapies. Right. Right. So it's not going to be mutagenic. Exactly. No oncogenes. And if it were going to uh, get out and infect humans, it probably would have already. Right. And these are all properties of the real virus that we talked about mm-hmm. previously, as which is being used for oncotherapy. But this has a different kind of uh, tropism. So right. obviously you want to develop more than one. So a phase one trial is basically to see if the virus is toxic or and to figure out what dose you want to use if, if you can go forward. And, and it doesn't prevent you from collecting other data on the uh, subjects while you're at it. That's right. Right. And they put in a couple of doses of virus. Boy, they put a lot of mm-hmm. virus. They, 10 to the 11th virus, viral particles per kilogram right. of patient. Right. I mean, people are multiple kilograms, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of virus. They did 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 7th, to 10 to the 10th, and then 10 to the 11th, three different... A mouse. They put it in intravenously. And these were patients with advanced cancers, right? Mm-hmm. Neuro and I think they were mixed neuroendocrine and small cell lung cancers. Right. Well, there's a table here that uh, small cell carcinoma and mixed neuroendocrine. And these are people who had been treated and the treatment didn't work. And they're basically on their last leg. In fact, I think two people died very early on after being injected with this virus. Two people yeah. in the small cell carcinoma group yeah. uh, died apparently of their disease shortly after being <clears throat> infected with the, desire, uh, with the virus. And although they were confident that they had not died of the uh, treatment, they nevertheless um, restricted the study based on that finding. So the people in that group did not get the higher doses of virus. They stuck with the the lower dose. So that sort of uh, restricted the study based on their initial plan. Right. right. So I think a thir- total of 30 people they looked at. Mm-hmm. So they gave them the virus. They inject um, intravenously one dose, right, with three, to- three groups of people with different doses. And then they look for antibodies. They look for virus in the serum. And then uh, so those who, in, who died, they could look at the tumors to see if there was virus in the tumors and if, if they had gotten better or whatever. They were using some old guy methods here, right? They titrated the virus <laughs> by um, TCID50, yeah, infect right. cells, mm-hmm. and looked for cytopathic effect. I was happy to see that. <laughs> no microfluidics yep. here. All right. <laughs> so let's do the antibodies first, serum antibodies, neutralizing. Um, right. So two people had detectable antibodies at baseline prior to administration. That's interesting. Yeah. So it yeah. suggests so, that maybe a cross-reactive virus yeah, or... Yeah, I was going to ask if you know enough about this virus to say whether or not there might be some cross-reactivity. It's pretty closely related to cardioviruses, which are known to pop into people now and then. Um, and so some of these people might have encountered those. So and they don't say whether those two people were farmers. Yeah. Could farmer or a zoo zoo person, a zoo handler, right. often get infected. But everybody else developed neutralizing antibodies, pretty high titers here, according to right. figure one. Yeah, everybody right. everybody cleared the virus um, and developed antibodies. Yeah. Which also develop- means you, you wouldn't be able to do a second round of treatment. Right. Yes, that's a problem. You, if you have these this nice antibody response, you, know, you can't do it again. And they address that in the discussion. Yeah, they that's say that's sort of a good news, bad news thing. It says that, you know, you can you can clear the virus, and that might be good news, okay? But the bad news is we probably can't use yeah. it again. Yeah, you want to, you want to clear the virus. Um, but uh, I, I guess to do a, a second round, you'd have to come up with some other yeah. antigenic type of the virus or some other virus. They were actually suggesting immunosuppressing the patients mm-hmm. so they don't make antibodies. Right which sounds a little scary to me. Well, you know, Vincent, uh, I'm now 
about a third of the way through the emperor of all maladies. Mm -hmm. And the history of cancer treatment is full of really scary stuff. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know? You're right. They do. They, they they got in order to cure you. They got to nearly kill you. Yeah, you know? you're right. You're right. I'm I'm not made for these kinds of studies. Certainly. <laughs> okay. Then they looked at virus in the blood. And uh, they had a mixed picture here. Most of the individuals cleared the infection, but uh, they had some, some who had the small cell lung carcinoma, they actually produced virus. The titers go up uh, before day five. Go yeah. way up, yeah. way up over over the initial dose. Yeah, this is RNA copies per mil, 10 to the 10th RNA copies per mil, so it's quite a bit. Right, and it supports the idea that the virus found some place to replicate. Yeah, <clears throat> so they say maybe in the small cell carcinoma the virus is replicating. Now, the mixed newer endocrine looks to me like most of them, the virus has just cleared maybe with the exception of the 10 to the 8th, there's a little blip at day 5. But for the most part, uh, they're cleared, yeah. So maybe replication in the small, clearly replication, I wouldn't doubt that. Even in that mixed neuroendocrine guy, that uh, blip is barely above the input, whereas in the small cell lung carcinoma, it's, huge. it's getting one, two, three, four, four something logs over the input. Yeah. So that would suggest that this is going, the virus replicates well in small cell lung carcinoma cells. They also did some immunohistochemistry. They have sections from a patient uh, who died of disease day 28 after getting the virus. So this is one of those individuals who died early on. And they took liver and kidney and pancreas, made sections, and stained them with antibodies that detect the virus. It's a mouse anti antiserum against Seneca Valley virus. And you can see very nice staining in areas of the liver where there are tumors, the liver metastases as opposed to normal liver. There's nothing. So it looks like there is virus in the metastatic cells. Right. Yep. Specifically. And not yep. growing in the others. And so that's good. So that's good as well. And then finally, uh, clinical activity. Does this do anything to the tumors? Now, RECIST, R-E-C-I-S-T. Anybody know what that is? Uh, yeah, I looked that up. Hang on, let me find it. I got too many tabs open here. <laughs> uh, response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. A set of published rules that define when cancer patients improve or uh, that is respond or stay the same, stabilize or worsen progression during treatment. So okay. there's some set of criteria that's established by the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer and the National Cancer Institute, blah, blah, blah. So it's a Okay. So they say here concept. none of these patients uh, had objective anti-tumor responses by resist criteria. Right. But they say that in the one cohort of small cell Carcinoma patients with it, which received 10 to the seventh virions per kilogram, one patient with rapid, previously rapidly progressive disease after drug treatment experienced disease stabilization, which persisted for 10 months after infusion, and that patient is still alive three years after getting Seneca Valley virus. So I don't know if that is because of the virus or it just happened. It happens sometimes, right? Yeah, this I, is why this is why you don't pull efficacy data out of a phase one. Yeah. Right. Um, you've got six patients. Uh, uh, what do you really know? Right. <laughs> so it's, there is some at some rate, and not very common in many cancers, but uh, at some rate, people will simply recover. Yeah. And have, they are also, in most cases, they've been given other drug regimens, and these patients have been through a lot of other treatments. And uh, so, if somebody gets better, you don't know why. I am and acquainted it's a with very an small sample. I'm acquainted with an individual who was in a uh, clinical trial, fancy clinical trial for a, a cancer treatment, and who um, uh, was cured, basically. Uh, and when they unblinded the study, it turned out that. Uh, uh, he was a placebo. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that's uh, what was this drug that the FDA just caught a lot of flack for uh, saying that it doesn't cure. Oh, there was a, there was. Um, I'm blanking on it. It was it was big news in 
biopharma. Um, they uh, they took away the indication for one of these um, advanced chemotherapies that was out there, and and lots of patients were coming forward saying, "Oh, but I was cured by this drug," and the clinical data just don't support that. Right. Uh, yeah. So they they are actually they sound excited about this. But well, I would be too. Despite yeah, sure. all that, I'd still be excited. Well, it's good. We saved one person's life for at least yeah, three years. Right. That's good. Or yeah, and also, whatever. and also, you know, just because you can't get solid efficacy data out of a phase one doesn't mean it's useless. Yeah, sure. Right. This trial tells you that it's safe to give these people to give people this virus, um, even at at ridiculously high doses. Right. Um, they didn't see any toxicity in anybody, so it's uh, it's as as a phase one, it's a it's a home run. I think the two most remarkable things about this uh, are the things that really struck me are first the uh, the burst of virus replication in the people with that specific disease, the small cell lung mm -hmm. carcinoma, and right. second the uh, autopsy uh, histology on that person showing that there's virus specifically associated with the malignant tissue and not the normal tissue. That's pretty amazing. Right. Not only not only is it safe, but it also appears to be working the way you expected it to. Yeah, it's amazing. They administer this just intravenously, okay? So the tropism is really uh, uh, remarkable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and why that is, they, they're interested in figuring mm -hmm. out what they say in their discussion. So we, from this, we can say putting a lot of this virus intravenously is safe, up to 10 to the 11th virions per kilogram. They say, we'd like to explore higher doses. Sure. And they're going to do a phase two to do that. They're actually enrolling. And uh, they have uh, 90 subjects. They're going to give um, 10 to the 11th virions per kilogram uh, to each patient. Yeah, and in phase two, you do actually usually try to get efficacy data. And so you have higher numbers, right? Yeah, there, there you're enrolling more patients with the condition. Um, you've figured out dosage, or at least you've figured out uh, um, a baseline for dosage. And you're moving ahead and, and trying to figure out what kind of um, treatment rate you get. All right. So here, yeah, let me clarify. So they only they put low amounts in the small cell carcinoma patients, 10 to the 7th right. per kilogram. They want to try 10 to the 11th in that population. In that population. So that's what this phase 2 is, only with small cell lung carcinoma. Mm -hmm. Right. There you go. Okay. So that'll be interesting. And they have to meet certain criteria. They have to be people who, according to what's going on so far, they actually expect to uh, live more than six months because they don't want to deal with this thing again of getting into the trial and having people die on them. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed yeah, they pa had Patient to. selection for trials is a whole science of its own. Yeah, it takes quite a while. I noticed when they, the two patients died, they had to sit down with the FDA and decide what to do. Yeah, small small cell lung carcinoma. By the way, is uh, the primary reason for that is cigarette smoking. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I looked it up. Okay, I wanted to be sure. It's very rare in people who don't smoke. Mm -hmm. So there's another way to cure this disease. <laughs> well, yes. Stop smoking, right? Yeah. Right. Well, Howard Temin had lung cancer, and he never. That's smoked. right. That's right. You. Uh, there are uh, cases of this in people who don't smoke. And for those of you who don't remember, Howard Temin, a one of the co-recipients of the Nobel Prize for discovering reverse transcriptase in tumor viruses. But that's in one of our old twibs. So that's a nice study, I thought, of uh, a picornavirus being used as a anti-tumor therapy. And I wanted to just point out one more thing in this poster by um, <laughs> Nick... Nick Knowles and colleagues, he says, in order to assess the exposure of the human population to Seneca Valley virus 1, serum samples were obtained from normal humans as well as from farmers. <laughs> I guess he just didn't write it correctly. I hope there are no farmers listening. Okay. Well, we're or not maybe, the ones who said that. No, I didn't That's, say it. It's Nick Knowles, right. the coronavirologist. Well, it just means that farmers are special. That's all. <laughs> And I'll go along with that. I would have written obtained from healthy humans. Wait, including, how, including. Including farmers. farmers. Including right. farmers. Yeah, something like that. Alan would or, have written. Or obtained, obtained from farmers as well as humans with other occupations. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll put a link to that poster because I found it on Google, so it's out there. 
So you can take a look at that. All right, let's do a few email. First one is from Marshall. Dear TWIV hosts, I'm sure you've already heard about this, but I was curious what your take on this study is. He links to a paper. Let me uh, clear up my my desk, my tabs. I got tabs like you. You got tabs. I, I've got rid of most of them now. I've, I've been cleaning them up as we go along. Uh, yeah, I, I usually close tabs as we finish right. stuff. So I was re- telling I was telling Vincent before the show started. <laughs> this is a a record number of tabs. This show. I had so many <laughs> that it was choking Chrome. That means you're learning, I, right? I couldn't. I guess. So he sent us an article in News.com. VoiceofAmericanews.com. SIV vaccine holds promise for AIDS. And then I, I was able to find the original article, which is profound early control of highly pathogenic SIV by an effector memory T cell vaccine. And before we talk about it, I'll finish his email. I understand that studies showing results in monkeys don't necessarily translate well to humans, but I thought it was interesting that they might have been able to completely wipe out the virus in some monkeys. If I understood the article correctly, I'm a linguist. Science is just a hobby of mine for now. So I was curious what you all thought about this possibility, possibly leading to an effective vaccine cure for AIDS. Best and worst case scenarios. Thanks for all the free lessons. I enjoy all three podcasts tremendously. And as I said, I'm not a scientist yet, but thanks in large part to your podcast, I'm seriously considering it for when I retire from the military in a few years. Keep up the good work. So this um, is an interesting paper. They basically immunize rhesus monkeys with a vector containing uh, simian immunodeficiency virus genes because it's a nice model for uh, HIV infection of humans. And they use as a vector a rhesus monkey cytomegalovirus. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. And that right. is a virus that persistently infects the animals. Right. So this hasn't been tested in people. We use these acute vectors like adenoviruses and, and others. So they get a very strong memory T cell response, which, as the, our listener wrote, uh, was very effective at preventing infection. So the idea would be there, if I understand it correctly, is that using CMV, which is uh, it, it's basically a persistent latent infection, you would continuously stimulate this immune response. Is that the idea? Well, I don't know if that's it, if there is just another way that these vir- the, this vector presents the antigen so that you get more effective memory responses. It could, okay. be, it could be either one. I don't know. Uh, but it it looks very good, and um, I, the only thing I thought about was I don't know if you could use in human CMV vectors because, at least human CMV, because we're all infected. Right. right. We have probably antibodies, and I'm not sure it would work. Or at least 90% of us do. Yeah, maybe you could use a rhesus vector in humans. I don't know. So there are a lot of questions here. I mean, even though we have antibodies, we also all, you know, harbor, uh, well, a lot of us harbor latent uh, yeah. CMV with occasional uh, sort of uh, a little bit of uh, lytic infection going on. It could be, right. I'm just making this up, that you can actually replace or supplement what we already have with some more. I mean, obviously the virus is is used to being in some sort of uh, equilibrium with the immune system, Okay. Um, and so maybe you can take advantage of that to sneak in another uh, related uh, virus yeah. that's um, uh, making some novel antigens. So they conclude here, the ability of these rhesus CMV vectors to indefinitely maintain SIV-specific memory responses, independent of the level of SIV replication, provides for continuous surveillance of SIV-infected cells. Thus, CMV vectors provide a powerful new approach for HIV-AIDS vaccine development that could be used alone or in combination with other vaccine strategies. It sounds to me that this would be very interesting to pursue in people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a very promising approach. Um, the The asterisk on that is that AIDS vaccine development is littered with the corpses of very promising approaches. Yeah, right. That's right. This right, is a so field that they, this is this is not new that somebody has something that looks really really good in an animal model and they go into humans and yeah. it just 
falls on its face, and the, and this could be the exception. Could be. Uh, well, to, to the credit, it is a new approach. People right, it's a novel completely. approach. Yeah. It's a it is a no, novel. it is a novel approach, and we certainly need novel approaches yeah. in that. Right. I think, uh, Rich, we should ask uh, Julie Overbaugh on Tuesday what she thinks about this. Oh, good idea. She works on this, right? I mean, AIDS vaccines. So, good idea. Let's do that. See what her take is. Remember that. Stick it in that uh, schedule. Yeah, I'll write it down here. Um, I'll see. just open another tab. <laughs> That's Julie Tuesday. And um, so there you go, Marshall. It's going to be years before um, this goes into people. As yeah. we said, uh, we it takes a long time to do clinical trials. But anyway, there you go. Kay writes, Dear Twivers, I've been following your podcast from day one, but never got around to mailing you. Like everybody else, I love your show and plan to ask you some more or less intelligent virus-related question later on. <laughs> I, one of the things that keeps amazing me is the broad range of occupations held by your listeners. In a recent episode, you read email from somebody working with Rockwell Automation. While mentioning this, you said something along the lines of, I wonder what they are producing. Well, apparently a lot of things, among them the famous retro encabulator, which is a greatly improved version of the original turbo encabulator. You should really watch the short two-minute videos. They are hilarious. Did you these guys are, look at these? These yeah. are classics. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> I, that, I just, I, this went straight on my Facebook page, okay? They're, they're just so hilarious. They're really yeah. hilarious. I, I had seen these uh, a while ago, and they're they're they are absolute classics. I was I was for a few seconds wondering if they were serious or not. Oh, absolutely! When I first got into the first one, I thought you know this is all serious, and then it got it degrades it got crazier yeah. and crazier. Yes, yeah, because he starts out actually reasonably sane, and then the, the words <laughs> just are amazing. So we'll put the links in. You have to see those. Thanks, yes. Kay. Uh, Debbie writes. Dear Education Pioneers on TWIV. I like that. I'm a pediatrician in Taiwan. I'll be finishing my last year of fellowship in pediatric infectious disease this summer. One year ago, I noticed TWIV on iTunes. The interesting topics and your witty conversations soon fascinated me. I became a regular listener ever since. My favorite show was episode 103 with Dr. L.J. Tan. As a specialist of pediatric infectious disease, I was very happy to hear such an organized talk clearly pointing out the major issues in immunization and providing simple but crucial information. During the pandemic H1N1 influenza in 2009, we had a large proportion of parents refusing H1N1 influenza vaccinations for their children in Taiwan. People learned about H1N1 vaccine mostly from the mass media, especially news or talk shows. It took a great deal of time and effort in our clinics to clarify the rumors about the vaccines and to emphasize the importance of influenza immunization. During the interviews in the vaccine clinics, I learned that there was a gap between facts and misunderstanding toward vaccination in the public. The gap could only be filled by constant education. From time to time, Vincent and Alan would raise this issue and address public awareness about vaccination in different episodes. It was such a motivation for we clinicians trying to continue the efforts in public health. On the other hand, there's also a huge gap between lab findings and medical care. Physicians sometimes have a hard time to understand the scientific findings. However, virology becomes far more interesting through your introduction, debates, and analysis. I love to hear a variety of topics in virology and microbiology. Also, thanks to Vincent and ASM for creating TWIM. You inspire me to pursue another adventure in research. I'm about to start my PhD program this autumn. You help me to realize the happiness in learning and self-improvement. Thank you all for making science as a vivid and interesting subject. It is always a great pleasure to hear stories of scientific discovery from Rich and Dick. I truly admire your enthusiasm as public educators. Keep up the great work. Awesome. Really Very nice. nice. Thank nice. you. So she sends us a link to a good educational website of evolution from Berkeley. They provide simple and detailed explanations about evolution, such as phylogeny, through kindergarten to undergraduates. It's a nice little site from the University of California at Berkeley. Understanding cool. evolution, your one-stop source for information on evolution. 
it's cool. I've Thank always you. wanted to understand the phylogeny, phylogeny of kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated. Yes. Oh, thank you, Debbie. Cool. Yes. Cool to be getting a PhD. All right. The next one is from Chad, who writes, I don't know if I heard correctly, but did you say that CFS and fibromyalgia were related or one in the same? You guys remember? I don't remember saying uh, that. Somebody may have misspoke at some point. But yeah, they're, they're conditions that are next to each other. Um but they're not one and the same, certainly. So if any of us did say that, we misspoke. They have some uh, overlapping symptoms, right? Yeah, they have overlapping symptoms and kind of the same diagnosis of exclusion status. And the thinking is that they're, uh, among some people, I think, is that they may be on the same spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like Asperger's and autism, you know, and people talk about autism spectrum disorder. Um, so it's it's one of these situations where you have a couple of diagnoses that are that have some similarities and so they're kind of often pushed into the same general bucket right i'm asking because i don't want to put words in your mouths i was diagnosed with fibromyalgia about a year and a half ago and i do notice that unless i get a minimum of eight to ten hours of sleep i have a hard time functioning it would be interesting to be tested to see if i have xmrv i don't recommend that no neither do i i think uh, many of the tests are fraught with contamination so and i don't know xmrv that specific virus is a laboratory contaminant right now you might have xenotropic murine leukemia viruses which are different but whether they cause disease we don't know so i'm not sure if it would be so useful for you to 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 look at that chad next one is from jason Good day from Down Under. You've probably already seen these stories, but I thought I should send them through anyway. The first is a Hendra virus vaccine announcement. I just erased this, but there it is. <laughs> That's the wrong citation. Uh, I, he gave us a... You're uh, just going all over the place I know. Here, he gave us a uh, article in The Australian, but I went back to the original uh, art, uh, research article, which now I can't find. Uh, I got it here. Bring it up, please. Uh, hang on. I thought I put it in there. It's, okay. I, yeah, for some reason it doesn't exist, and I had oh. it before. Wait a minute. It's basically a Hendra vaccine. There you go. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Rich. Google Docs has this weird new thing of giving you an intermediate page. I don't know why. Or combinant only, Hendra. Only sometimes. Yeah. yeah. A recombinant Hendra virus G glycoprotein based subunit vaccine protects ferrets from lethal Hendra virus challenge. So remember, Hendra is the virus along with Nipah, uh, two zoonotic infections uh, originating in Southeast Asia and Australia from fruit bats and going into horses in the case of Hendra, Hendra infecting racehorses and then their handlers and killing them. And so you, this vaccine would be for the horses to protect them. Right. So it is a uh, vaccine based on the glycoprotein. They make the glycoprotein, which the virus uses to attach to cells. They put it, mix it with adjuvant and inject it into ferrets, and it protects them. So I guess the bar is lower for making a horse vaccine than a human vaccine, right? Quite. Quite lower. Yep. So that looks pretty good. So he sent us an Australian article about that, but... Uh, there is a scientific paper, so thank you for that, Jason. And also, he sends a summary of the Nigerian type 2 vaccine-derived poliovirus outbreak, which is a very nice paper in uh, Journal of Infectious Diseases. It's a summary of the entire outbreak in Nigeria, 315 cases of type 2 polio caused by circulating vaccine-derived virus. So the story here is that a number of years ago, Nigeria stopped immunizing their population for one year. Uh, because they didn't trust the polio vaccine. And in that time, they had a lot of polio. They resumed immunization after one year with just type 1 and type 3 vaccine because type 2 had been eradicated, according to WHO. So then they had an outbreak of type 2 polio because they weren't immunizing against it, and it was vaccine-derived type 2 polio. Yep. So it shows that the vaccine-derived strains can circulate extensively. And uh, so WHO got fooled. 
they thought it's eradicated, but the vaccine-derived viruses were still there. So that's a great summary of that outbreak. So I this figure, I'm looking at this figure from that paper. I, I, wow, it's fascinating to see the mm -hmm. number of cases and the vaccine schedule because this figure has them vaccinating with trivalent up to a certain period of time and there's nothing going on, okay? And then they changed it to monovalent OPV1 for a while and a few cases come back. Then they introduced trivalent for a while and then the, then then they quit that and then there's a long period without any trivalent and there's this just uh, one and two and then there's this huge spike of cases and then they introduce the trivalent again and it goes mm -hmm. away. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, and the reason for that gap is really, um, really annoying. There was a, a rumor spreading in Nigeria apparently that uh, vaccination was part of some Western plot. And so there was enormous paranoia about it and they stopped vaccinating um, mm -hmm. as a result of that. And there, I, I don't know if something similar to that is going to happen now that uh, I don't know if you guys heard about this uh, CIA stunt in Abbottabad. Yeah, I heard about that. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Did you hear they that, set Rich? up a fake vaccination yes. clinic to try and uh, collect I, DNA yeah. samples. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, uh, so they, if, if anybody at the CIA is listening, thanks a lot for that, guys. Yeah, right. Yeah. Hey, I gave a talk yesterday at a class at Columbia, and someone asked me about that, and they said, do you think this will affect the, the vaccine uptake? And absolutely. Absolutely. It. It's a very bad thing to play with. Yeah, it's just it's just that's just perfect for the uh, vaccine conspiracy theorists uh, to just jump all over. What yeah. a bummer! Okay, thanks for those, Jason. He, Jason is in Australia. He's at the WHO Polio Virus Reference Laboratory. Great. Cool. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, the next one is from Jonathan. First off, I am starting from the beginnings of your show, and I am currently at episode thirty-one. I'm enjoying it very much. Being a person who could never afford to go to college. I'm also learning a lot about a topic I've really never paid much attention to. I think it's great that a number of people like to go back and listen to them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I thought that's good because none of them really go out of date, right? No. Right. With a few exceptions, maybe. This contains spoilers for people who haven't seen the following show. I've been watching The Event on NBC. Over the last couple of weeks, virology has been fairly important to the episodes. The aliens, who are 1% different genetically from humans, they can, be, they can interbreed with humans. The aliens' world is dying, and they are trying to take over the Earth. In the episodes, they dug up a corpse of a Russian soldier. He had died of a particularly virulent strain of the 1918 flu. The virus would kill humans in a few hours from aerosol contact. The aliens are immune to the virus. They released it on a subway car packed with video cameras to see the spread of the virus. In the show, they had the people dr dying with lesions around the mouth and profuse bleeding from their nose and mouths. To stretch out the infectious period so more people would be infected, they needed to have the virus mutate into a strain that would have a longer infectious period. To do this, they infected one of the hybrid children. They did this via an infected pustule swab into a nostril and thus got their superhuman eliminating virus. Here are my problems with this. A, depending on the 1% genetic difference, is crossbreeding possible? I mostly ignore this thanks to many years of Star Trek. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, this, this person, who is this? This is J uh, Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan, really. Jonathan, you've really got everything together here. This is yes. really very good stuff. Yes. Well, uh, chimps and humans are about 1% different. Yep. Right? Yeah. Okay. So. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Any, either of you watch this? But the uh, Star Trek reference is perfect. That's great. They, yes. Yeah. You know, they get, uh, they're, they're always landing on a planet that's populated by aliens who evolved there and just happen to be sexually compatible with humans. And, right. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> no, I have not seen this show. Yeah, I haven't either. And they didn't. Uh, they didn't ask me to uh, be a consultant on their virology. Well, if they did, they wouldn't listen to you anyway, because what you would tell them would make for a boring TV show. Because <laughs> you would tell them the truth. All right. <laughs> All right. B. Using the Spanish flu, Russian variant, because of its nastiness. I have heard that if 1918 flu came out today, that it wouldn't be necessarily as bad as it was then, mainly due to better health care and sanitation. All right, Jonathan, we have, they, scientists have reconstructed the 1918 flu virus. 
it's quite lethal in mice and ferrets, more so than any other flu strain that we have. So it appears to be quite a virulent virus. Whether it would do the same thing in the population is not clear, because yes, we do have better health care. We have antibiotics and so forth. Which, uh, and which, and which, we can get we can get together a vaccination uh, a vaccine and a vaccination program in a in a pretty yeah. pretty big hurry. Yeah, and the antibiotics, by the way, are for secondary bacterial infections, right? Right, not, not which are right. A, which are a significant problem. Right, so it's not a bad idea to use that strain or to try and use it in, in this scenario, I suppose. See, it kills people in hours from aerosol contact. This, that would mean they inhaled the virus particle, it incubated, obtained critical mass, became infectious, and killed in hours. Again, not really a strong point from past education. That'd make this the nastiest airborne virus in the world, and why are we even still alive? You got that right, Jonathan. That's yep. uh, pretty far out. Yeah, good. yeah. It's really unlikely that it's killing people in a couple of hours. Just no way. Uh, D, they are immune. Must be that 1% again. Yeah, the aliens are immune to this virus. If a, per- if a person can catch a simian virus, swine, or avian virus, I don't have the numbers exactly, but I'm certain in all of those cases that a genetic difference is greater than 1%. Well, in this particular case, you know, they, you know, 1% difference again, they could be immune. That's okay. Though it is flu, which does do interspecies transmission. Right. Uh, as he points out. Yeah, but out. the aliens are from another planet. You know, yeah. you can you just need one amino acid difference to be resistant to a virus. So Okay. You could, so they got so they got that part right. That could be. Right. That's not, I don't have so much of a problem with that. Right. I don't know if immunity is the right word because that would imply they'd been infected and had resistant. resistant. Resistant, right. Uh, E, blood and lesions. Must be Hollywooding it up here. I do not know anyone who has had facial lesions from the flu. I can buy the blood tearing in the lungs from excessive hard coughing. Yeah, yeah, flu doesn't cause facial lesions. It's it's secondary to something else. Right, Right, Jonathan. Yeah, but I mean, you know, flu-like symptoms are not really gory enough for a TV show. No. No. Uh, F, the mutation. I like the way he capitalizes mutation. After infect- so, after infecting one person who apparently fell on the wrong side of the whole 1% line, <laughs> this is great, the aliens have obtained the necessary viral mutation. For some reason, the likelihood of this happening has sent my BS meter back for refurbishment <laughs> due to a broken dial. Additionally, wouldn't this have also made the virus possibly infectious to themselves? I look forward to eventually hearing your thoughts on this. Violated gorilla, Jonathan. Uh, the mutation is a bit of a stretch, yes. So what did they yeah. do here again? They, they uh, infected a hybrid child, an alien-human hybrid. And uh, then, because it's a hybrid, it has partial resistance to the virus, I guess. And it took took longer to replicate, right? That's the idea. Right. Yeah, I would think that would actually be a strategy for attenuating the virus. Mm-hmm. Well, in a way, it is. It's making it take longer to replicate, right? But there's yeah. no selection there, except for the person being a hybrid. So the right. immune system or whatever the the difference is that makes the aliens resistant. You know, it's not all, it's not all that bad. I don't have so much of a problem with that, but I don't think one passage would do it. Right. Right. right? It just would take longer. In general, uh, you know, when you attenuate viruses, you do pass them through different hosts. So the the hybrid is, in in theory, a different host. Uh, but the point about uh, it making the virus possibly infectious to the aliens is valid, because taking an intermediate host um, could yes, very well right. get right. the virus the rest of the way. Yes, that's right. absolutely valid. Yep, there, there you go. But yeah, John- if you're watching a show about a, a life form that evolved on another planet and ended up being only 1% different from humans, then I think you have to suspend a whole lot of disbelief. Uh, yeah, and this happens to me watching sci-fi shows all the time. You find yourself, you know, nitpicking little bits in it when people are flying around in other galaxies, okay? Yeah, and, and explosions that make noise in space. Right. You know, just, oh, there's all sorts of stuff in sci-fi <laughs> movies that just doesn't work. You remember in Star Trek when the, when the spaceships went through space, it made noise, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They go roaring through space and things blow up into fiery balls in a vacuum. Yeah, it's... Uh, it is science fiction. It is science fiction. You have to remember that, right? The problem is that many people see these and they think this is part reality, especially with viruses. I don't know why that is. Uh, There is a new movie out, I'm sure you guys have heard, or coming out, called Contagion. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, this is uh, quite a high-budget film 
for which Ian Lipkin is a script consultant. Yeah, but are they going to listen to him? Exactly. Because, again, the truth is just it doesn't make for good movies. I don't know. Smallpox is pretty gross. It, yeah, know? but it's it's not dramatic in the 90-minute time frame that you need. True. So the trailer for Contagion is out, so we'll put a link to that, folks, so you can go watch it. And, guys, I think what we should do when it comes out in September, the fall, we should all see it and then do a, a discussion on TWIV. Good idea. And maybe sure. we'll get Ian Lipkin to join us. Ooh. Right? And we'll he, say, he we'll may go not th- want to, depending <laughs> on how it turns out. We'll go through it and, <clears throat> and sort of synopsize it and say what our problems were. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. We do that. Jonathan, your BS meter's working just fine. Yeah, it's yes. a good good job, Jonathan. Did you learn this from Twiv? I hope so. Yeah, you yeah. starting at episode up to thirty one. Okay, the next one is from Peter. Uh, he is from Korea. Dear Twiv hosts, many thanks for still keeping up the high quality after one hundred and thirty three episodes. I'm looking forward to listening to one thirty four tonight. Also, many thanks for Twip and Twim. I wanted to bring an article to your attention as a follow-up to TWIV number 39 back in July 2009. Yes, it's been a while. It's about the virus contamination at Genzymes Manufacturing Plant in Alston, Massachusetts. The article's open access and can be found here. He gives us a link. Actually, I don't get this to work. Oh, no, that link's broken. Maybe it's maybe it's spelled wrong. I don't know. What do you think, uh, Alan? Um, could be... I'm trying to deconstruct the link now. Um, Love ah, it has a a dot com within the link. Uh, well, anyway, maybe yeah. we'll work it out. He sent us a PDF, but he says you might find it interesting. Not much industrial matters, but pure virology background information. So this was a case where they had a viral contaminant in their product. Do you guys remember this? Mm-hmm. Twiv thirty nine. Yeah. Do you remember what the contaminant was? Uh, I don't remember. Me either. Now let's look it up. Was it like an Anello virus or something like that? I'm going to look it up. Twiv39. Wow. That's before you came on, Rich, isn't it? Uh, I think so. Okay. Hmm. Here you go. Boston Globe article on Genzyme. <laughs> going to go to the Boston Globe. Virus shuts Genzyme plant. Okay. It's loading. It's loading. It's loading. June seventeenth, two thousand and nine. Nice looking plant. It's still loading. FDA warning letter to Genzyme. How about that? There you go. FDA manufacturer of a variety of enzymes, Fabrazyme, Serazyme, Myozyme. FDA says, you have deviated from good manufacturing practice. Uh Uh-oh. A whole bunch of stuff here. Doesn't say, I don't think it makes any mention of the virus, but... Nope, there's no mention there, and it's still loading, so I don't know. I don't remember what the virus was. Sorry, guys. Sorry, Peter. Also, Alan might want to comment on the volunteers mentioned in the physical chemical properties section. Noroviruses, members of Calisiviridae retain infectivity in the majority of volunteers following dot, dot, dot. Makes me wonder whether this volunteering is compensated with a cruise ship ride. All right, so we've, talk- <laughs> we've <laughs> talked about the uh, norovirus volunteers before. They are volunteers, yes. right? They're paid. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And entirely unrelated, could you elaborate on the hypothesis that the stopping of smallpox vaccination made a way for the HIV epidemic? This has been in the news recently again in the context of the current discussion over the destruction of the remaining smallpox virus stocks. If you have discussed this already, could you point me back to the relevant episode? Uh, we did discuss it. I can't identify the relevant episode. Can you, Vincent? Yeah. Uh, oh, gee, no, I don't. I found the paper, though. <laughs> yeah, I found the paper and uh, and also uh, this same individual's um, comment uh, about destruction of smallpox, which we also talked about on one show. I believe we talked about this paper. I don't know if it was a featured paper or anything like that, but, but we did talk about it. The paper basically uh, is, a, is an experiment where they compare HIV infection 
that is CCI5, CCR5 tropic HIV infection of um, uh, lymphocytes from naive individuals or na individuals who've been vaccinated in the past five months or several months uh, against uh, smallpox that is infected with vaccinia. And they find that uh, there's like a five-fold reduction of infectivity in uh, lymphocytes from the people who've been um, immunized with smallpox. And then they spin off from that and suggest that maybe the uh, cessation of smallpox vaccination uh, opened the door for uh, HIV. I right. think that's, first of all, fivefold is not a big effect. Uh, second, I haven't seen any of that stuff reproduced anywhere. Third, it is a an enormous leap to go from a fivefold effect uh, in culture in one experiment to talking about global epidemiology. And okay, fourth, so. the dates don't work. Yes, the dates don't work. Because um, HIV, the phylogeny that we have dates this back to, what, the 30s? Yes. Um, yeah. and, and smallpox vaccination was very much ongoing um, w well through that time and up into the 70s. And certainly in Africa, where HIV seems to have emerged, um, sm was the last place to stop vaccinating for smallpox. Right. And the emergence of, the emergence of HIV is really now quite well described okay and there's yeah. no there's no reason to invoke something like this so okay i am still looking for this uh, genzyme virus and i can't find it so you'll have to go back and listen to the episode because i've searched i've googled and none of the articles online identify the virus although we did we did way back when yeah have to listen to the episode next one is from michael who writes magic johnson was a spartan not a Wolverine. MSU, not UM. All right, on some episode, Dixon said he was a Wolverine. A Wolverine's a University of Michigan, is that right? Uh, must be, yes, yes. What's MSU? Michigan uh, State. Michigan State. Spartans. There you go, Dixon. So that's uh, uh, that really got somebody's hackles up. Yeah, it must it, be a anytime, thing. anytime you have two universities in the same state... Right. Uh, with similar names, they're, they're going to hate each other. So right. you got to get that <laughs> Next one is from Ken Twiv Crew. Just a quick email. The new perspective you had for Twiv 132 Virology 911 was great. It was very interesting to see the clinical aspects of these viruses, and I would love to see you adopt a clinician as a regular contributor. Thanks always for the wonderful podcast. Um, Vesivirus. Vesivirus. Oh, what the heck is that? Yeah, what's a Vesivirus? Quick. Viral zone, quick. <laughs> Vesi, Vesuvius comes from Vesuvius. A Khaleesi virus? Yeah, it's a Khaleesi virus. So, uh, yeah, it's a Khaleesi virus. All right, so. That, that was their problem. There you go. And Peter had sent us an update, which uh, we will try and figure out the URL. If not, um, Sorry, we can't get it. Single-stranded positive sense RNA, naked, uh, uh, naked, capsid, little guy. There you go. All right, you want to save this next one for Dixon? This I think, uh, one? yeah, I'd like to hear Dixon's reaction to this because it's got a bunch of okay, you yeah. know, fancy, fancy farming stuff in it. Got it. Uh, the next one's from Anthony. This is one of my virology class questions. The paper discussed in episode 115, Color Me Infected, focuses on infection by one type of virus. If multiple different virus families of viruses were to infect a susceptible cell at the same time, would you expect that certain types would be preferentially replicated over other types? Do you think that the type of viral genome, RNA versus DNA, in addition to other factors, would affect which viruses are more competitive for replication in the host cell? given that there is a limit on how many the cell can express at one time. Uh, yeah, I had, wait a minute, I'm trying to relocate myself. Yeah, you, you put a link here. Oh, yeah, okay, here it is. Um, to tell you the honest truth, I've always hated these kinds of experiments. I have, <laughs> I have to tell you this, okay? Uh, putting a couple of different viruses in the cell at the same time. Matter of fact, that was one of the first things I did as a graduate student. Co-infected cells with, uh, what were they? 
I think I infected uh, R17 infected cells with T4. There was some sort of story about how one affected gene expression from the other because of changes in the translation machinery or something. And mm -hmm. basically what I figured out is that one infection just basically blasted the other out of the universe. <laughs> but um, it is a value. I have, uh, I have one little story here. Um, that is uh, uh, that I put a link into. It's an old story, and I have. This is not the first uh, description of this, but it will contain the history. That I dug up a paper by Patricia Whitaker Dowling and Julie Youngner, uh, talking about how if you uh, the vesicular stoma, stomatitis virus, which is a model rhabdovirus, is very sensitive uh, to the effects of interferon. But if you co-infect with vaccinia virus, uh, vesicular stomatitis virus becomes resistant to the effects of interferon. Mm -hmm. And that implies that vaccinia virus does something to the interferon response, okay? That the vaccinia virus tweaks the uh, uh, innate immune response, which is, in fact, now that I think of it, one of the very, very first indications that pox viruses have immunomodulatory functions. And it turns out that the virus uh, actually does uh, tweak the immune response. In this particular case, many years later, it was figured out uh, mostly by uh, Bert Jacobs. Uh, da uh, Whitaker Dowling and Youngner uh, uh, took it up to almost a conclusion, and then uh, uh, Bert Jacobs uh, purified the uh, protein. It's one of the uh, uh, gene products from vaccine is a double-stranded RNA binding protein that sequesters double-stranded RNA, which is the trigger for this particular immune response. So if you put vaccine in, it takes away the double-stranded or it sequesters the double-stranded RNA and squench, uh, squelches the immune response and VSV can grow. So that's an example of what uh, dual infections, how, one sort of interaction that dual infections can do. Yeah, when I first came here, I, we did, I had a friend of mine who worked on adenovirus, so we got together and co-infected cells with adenovirus and poliovirus. Uh, and polio <clears throat> trashed the whole thing, right? Exactly. Of course, it depends right. on the timing. If you, if okay. you, because polio shuts off translation, right? So you can you can play with timing. But there are a lot of examples of these co-infections, and generally yeah. viruses don't mm -hmm. do well when right. they co-infect cells. The, uh, the polio, other. the polio uh, protease, really is a toxic protein. Yes, absolutely. All right. Does anyone have a pick? Of the week. Alan, do you have one? I do have a pick of the week. All right. Um, so mine is a new podcast um, called Germlines. It was just launched by Michael Walsh, uh, who does the Infection Landscapes blog, which I think we hit as somebody's pick a while ago. Yeah. Um, he's at SUNY Downstate. Um, and he just started podcasting. So he now does this. Uh, he's just did episode two. Uh, where he talks about the um, uh, the effects of different microenvironments on malaria, um, covers a neat paper in that, and uh, it seems like it's uh, it's going to be a cool podcast. Excellent. Yeah, he wrote us a letter, I think. Yeah. And um, I think we're going to have him on Twiv in the fall. Good. Cool. I think that'll be fun. Yeah, his whole his whole shtick is is very cool to me. The the uh, literally landscapes of infection, how things travel through space how infections yeah. travel uh across areas so yeah check that out uh, excellent good luck michael with that yeah all right rich uh, i have something that i just uh, uh was introduced to today it's called i don't think we've done this before science 360. Mm -mm. um this is an nsf funded project that is basically just a website where uh i guess anybody can post uh, any short science video. And it's uh, organized in various different ways and it covers all aspects of science and the videos are of enormously high quality and really interesting. So what's so, what is wait, short? When you say anybody, there's some kind of moderation process. That uh, goes yes, on here. I believe so. How's, what's the uh, length short, we're talking like uh, two to eight minutes type stuff. Can't, okay? put a, can't put a TWIV video up there, huh? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, but I, I've just looked at a couple of these and they're, uh, and they're really cool. cool. Uh, the friend of mine who introduced me to this says he winds up just kind of staying up much too late at night, just, uh, flipping through, uh, flipping through all of these. There was one about viruses in the ocean. There weren't many about viruses, but there was, 
was yes, that one? Uh, I, I plan to apply for an NSF grant to support TWIV. Good idea. Because they have a lot of uh, opportunities, and it's not due till January next year, but I'm gearing up for it. Cool. Because I think so we're, there you go. we are worthy of such support. But that's a great site. Very nice. Uh, who's next? Me? Yes. Yeah, you're next. Yeah. All right. Well, mine is not really science, but it is useful for scientists and other people. It's Google+, Plus, which launched just uh, very recently. And, of course, it is Google's attempt to get into the social media arena, a uh, a an arena where you can uh, interact with other people. So Google+, Plus, you have people following you, and you follow other people, much like Twitter, except you can post longer things. You can put in pictures and videos and much more text than in Twitter. Much like Facebook. Very much like Facebook. The cool thing is that you can divide everyone into circles, and post only to individual circles, if you wish. So my main circle is science, and that's where I put almost everyone. And um, I have also started a list of scientists on on Google+, Plus, but it's uh, it's growing quickly. Well, it sounds great if I could get in. Yeah, I'm, I don't know Yeah, why. what's your problem, Alan? I don't know. You Vincent know, Alan, sent me an I, invitation, and I didn't, yeah, I didn't receive it on my Gmail account. I and, sent it uh, again today. Did you get anything today? Um. I just received um, something from an old college friend and something from SourceForge. So I have you in my science <laughs> circle. It says Alan Dove sharing via email only. I don't know why that would be. I don't even know how I, would, I don't even know how I would email it. Well, when I post something, uh, I can share it with my science circle, and then there's a little box that says also share it with your email, you know, people. So that's and you would get. Whatever I post by email, but that's not the way you want to be here. You want to be in it. Have and you posted anything by email? I have not. I, I could try that next time I do a post. Try posting will... something by email, and maybe I can sneak in that way. I'll, I'll that. invite you, Alan. Hey, why don't you okay. invite? Oh, him thank too. you, Rich. And I've... we'll see see what happens. I think. See, my theory is Google just doesn't like the cut of my jib. That <laughs> could be. Could be. <laughs> Very good. Anyway, it's really a nice uh, interactive area. It's a time sucker, unfortunately. But I think it could be a good way for scientists to get together. And I should point out the coolest feature, as far as I'm concerned, is something called a Hangout. So you can just start a Hangout, which is a video conference. And when you start one, it shows up in your stream. And anyone can join it who is in your circle. Depending yeah, on- I, liked, uh, I really like this because I've wanted, I've wanted to be able to get all of my kids on video conference simultaneously. And you can do it with Skype, but they want money for it. Right, so you can have up to 10 people in a Hangout. Rich and I were doing a Hangout the other day, and my friend Ray Ortega from ASM popped in. So, you, for example, one great use of this would be to do a podcast, or you could do office hours for a course. Sure. So I could say, okay, from 4 to 6 on Thursday, I'll be in the Hangout on Google+. Plus. That's a great idea. Whoever wants to ask questions. So you basically have a very nice window with all the individual people below hanging out. Whoever talks gets focused on the main video. It's well done. It's pretty cool. So check it out. Google Plus. That is my pick of the week. It's a pretty easy one. And I'll just keep banging on the gate. We'll get you in, Alan. All right. All right. We have a listener pick of the week. This is from Angus, who's a professor over at NYU medical school. Maybe this is old news, but I thought you would all enjoy the Science Weekly with Alok Jha podcast from the UK's Guardian newspaper. The 24th January 2011 episode offers a fascinating discussion of science-oriented blogging and how this can potentially enhance the dissemination of scientific discoveries and thinking, something dear to the hearts of all involved in TWIV. Anybody listen to this podcast? I did. I did. It's very good. It's basically a conference with a bunch of. Uh, it's a blogger conference, mm-hmm. and he the uh, this guy goes around and he interviews uh, all these bloggers and asks them, and they're science bloggers mostly. Oh, it's a, uh, it's a or, podcast blogging special. Okay, right, and cool. uh, and he interviews them and asks them, you know, why they blog, what they get out of it, and that kind of stuff. And uh, it, it's it's interesting. It's an interesting uh, peek into the mind of the blogger. And what blogging is all about. All right. right, He goes on. I think it's fair to say that many people are growing weary of the knee-jerk opinions that dominate the news cycle on TV and radio and which fuel poorly informed discussion of important matters ranging from vaccines or climate change to birth certificates. 
With, I don't know what he's talking <laughs> <laughs> With luck, we will see a return to more measured and reflective thinking, and folks like you will be at the vanguard of this return to sanity. That's very nice. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> I hope so. One of the bloggers interviewed on this podcast raised the interesting idea of not reporting on a major scientific paper until a few months have elapsed. This would give science journalists and bloggers time to gather measured opinions from independent experts in the area and perhaps include follow-up studies that support or refute the original splash. It is pointed out that for most people, it really doesn't matter if science news is delayed a little and that this does not hold up the science itself. I can't That's, imagine that happening. Good right? luck with that, yeah. Yeah, there is, there is one very simple way you could accomplish that, but it's never going to happen. And that is to eliminate embargoes and press releases, mm -hmm. because if you didn't have those, if you didn't have embargoed access to journals for journalists, um, and I have that and it's handy, but uh, if you didn't have that, where the journalists can read the papers before the rest of the world, and if you didn't have press releases to dumb down the science and misstate it, I'm sorry, to um, simplify the concepts for a wider <laughs> audience. Um, then you wouldn't be able to fuel this kind of hyperactive news cycle mm -hmm. because you simply could not get the story together the instant the paper came out and you're still grinding through the abstract. Um, it would be it would be self-enforcing, but that's never going to happen because the motivation to break that rule would be immense for any scientific journal that wanted to make a bigger splash. Yep. All so right. there you go. Providing thoughtful and tempered coverage of a complex issue is something you've done extraordinarily well with the ups and downs of the XMRV saga. Thinking back to your first discussions of this topic, would TWIV cover this story any differently today if you'd never mentioned it before? Uh, I don't, you know, well, I don't think so. Yeah, if we'd never mentioned it before, we'd probably... Oh, uh, yeah, okay. We would certainly be able to tell the story back from the known conclusion, which was not what, uh, what we saw coming. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but if we could do it over again, would we do it differently as the information came out? I don't think I would. But yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's a really good example of, I think it was fascinating how that story unfolded. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I would agree. want to do it differently. I, I think it's instructive to watch how it unfolded, yeah. you know. So I absolutely. I, but if we if we just saw the first paper today, the uh, well, the last one that the one that came out about it being a, the virus being a recombinant, then yeah, we would have said just kind of hold on, you know, is this the contaminant? Yeah. But I like the fact that we followed it from the start, and mm -hmm. I think that's an instructive course in yeah. itself. Cheers and keep on casting. Thank you, Angus. Yeah, I met Angus when I was in New York, and he was very encouraging about the podcast. I really appreciate that. He was uh, yeah. very supportive. He's a, he's a fan. He's written a few times, and we appreciate it. And he's a professor at NYU doing research in his lab. Good luck, Angus. All right, that'll do it. Twiv is at iTunes and the Zoom Marketplace or at twiv.tv. You can also listen to it. On your iPhone or Android device, we have an app at microbeworld.org slash app. As we said earlier, we're going over to the University of Minnesota. Is that it? That's it. University of Minnesota in Minneapolis to do ASV at, I'm sorry, to do TWIV at the ASV conference. So if you are there, check it out Tuesday, 19th July, 12 o'clock noon in the Mayo Auditorium. I have another good name. Last year we had the Procrastinator. The Procrastinator Theater, that's right. And now we have the Mustard, I mean the Mayo <laughs> Auditorium. Come by. Of course, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. Sorry you won't be with us. No, I'm sorry I won't be too. When your child is grown up, maybe you can travel a bit. Yeah, I can probably get away with it uh, sometime soon. So we'll see. I'll get back to, yeah, to going right. to conferences. Uh, you are in the young child phase. That's okay. We all went through yes. that no problem. <laughs> Rich Condit, thank you. You're quite welcome. Good fun. University of Florida at Gainesville. And we will see you. I'll probably see you tomorrow, right? See you tomorrow. There you go. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm at virology.com. 
WS. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.